atheists today have nowhere else to go. Uh, if they're not going to use a the multiverse, then they really do have to accept there's a personal being that brought the universe into existence, a personal being with far more knowledge and intelligence and creativity and power and care than we human beings. Hey guys, welcome to the Becca Cook Show. Today I have a very special guest. He is an astronomer and a believer. Uh, his name is Hugh Ross, and I'm excited to have him on the show because we're going to talk about science and kind of in God and how the two go together. And so I'm excited to have him on the show because uh, I think this is going to really help a lot of people and edify people in terms of faith, in terms of you know, what science is all about and, and how it correlates to faith. So Hugh Ross, welcome to the Becca Cook Show. Well, thank you for having me on your show. So tell us first what, what your, your organization is Reasons to Believe. Tell us about that. Right. Uh, you know, it's an organization my wife and I founded 36 years ago. And uh, what we do is we take the latest discoveries on the frontiers of scientific research and uh, use that to show people that the more we learn about nature and science, the more evidence we have for the supernatural handiwork of God. And beyond that, we show how what we see in science uh, comports what we see in the pages of the Bible, that the revelation of God through nature uh, corroborates what we see in the revelation of God through scripture and vice versa. Yeah, I love that. And I, I, I kind of, we kind of touched on this right before the show. I had, I have a friend from high school and uh, his name is Chase. And I saw him at a, a reunion, a high school reunion five years ago. And I, because I got saved 12 years ago. And so when I saw him, I mean, I told everyone at the reunion about my conversion and, and everything. And I, but I saw Chase and I told him about my story. He, he actually read my book. And I, but I told him about, you know, beating Jesus and, and having this amazing conversion. And his response to me was, Beckett, I'm a science guy. Like, I can't, I can't believe in God. So I want to use this episode to kind of dispel that myth <laughs> that sure. there is some sort of like uh, opposition of science and, and, and theology. And so first let's get into uh, so you've written many books. One, one of this is a great book. I just read this, "The Creator in the Cosmos." Uh, this is I highly recommend this. I have "Beyond the Cosmos," which is amazing. "Who Was Adam," which is amazing, and part of the Genesis debate, which I read in seminary, which I was surprised to find out when because uh, I went to my bookcase to get this, and I was like, "Wait, Hugh Ross? He's one of the authors." So. You've written many books, and um, including Why the Universe is the Way It Is and Navigating Genesis. You know, you mentioned your friend Chase. I meet a lot of people like Chase, and I tell them, uh, Chase, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't really get to know Christians till I was 27, but I began to be passionate about science when I was seven. I knew I would be an astrophysicist from the age of eight onwards and was very diligent studying that. And it's my study of astrophysics that brought me to faith in Christ and persuaded me that the Bible uh, was the inspired word of God. And that usually causes them to ask questions. Okay, well, how did, uh, how did that work for you? And so I just had an opportunity to get into the details. And then I often will respond by saying, you know, you think that there's a, an issue with science contradicting what the Bible reveals. Uh, where do you think there's a problem? And so I invite them to put me on the defensive, you know, show me where you think there's a problem or an issue and kind of help them uh, get through that. Tell us actually, cause that, that is, you talk about this in, uh, in the book, the creator and the cosmos, tell us how science led you to Christ. Like give us the details. Cause that is interesting. Right. Well, you were mentioning Albert Einstein and he was the one that came up with the theory of general relativity. And when he solved his equations, it predicted that the universe has a beginning. And uh, that kind of went against the grain of uh, astronomers at that time. Uh, but people like Edwin Hubble and uh, Slifer basically established, yes, 
the universe is expanding and it's expanding in a way that traces back to a cosmic beginning. And then over the uh, decades since Albert Einstein, the evidence has become progressively more and more compelling and extensive. There really is a cosmic beginning and not just any kind of beginning, but even a beginning of space and time itself, which implies there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that created our universe of matter, energy, space, and time. And it was at age 17, I became convinced that a cosmic beginner existed and began to look for that beginner. And I started looking for him in the writings of the great philosophers, especially the books by Immanuel Kant. And I realized that uh, he had the wrong concepts of space and time and of the universe. And uh, that's when I began to look at the world's holy books and uh, was able to quickly dispense of things like Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, uh, Baha'i. Uh, but eventually I picked up a Bible and I was given a Gideon Bible when I was 11 years old. I didn't read it till I was 17. But when I began to open up that Gideon Bible, I realized this book is different from all the other holy books. It accurately describes the state of the universe. It accurately describes the history of the universe, the history of Earth, and the history of Earth's life. And I especially was uh, blown away by the fact that I found passages in the Bible uh, that describe the Big Bang features of our universe. And as an astronomy student, I was aware no one had these concepts outside of the Bible until the 20th century, which told me that for thousands of years, the Bible stood alone in saying the universe has a beginning that includes a beginning of space and time, that it expands from that beginning. It expands under laws of physics that never change, from one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. And you know, I knew enough about physics to realize that meant the universe would have to get colder and colder in a highly predictable way. And so I was asking myself the question, it'll only be a matter of time before astronomers can make the temperature measurements. I wonder how these temperature measurements will comport with what the Bible predicted thousands of years ago. Well, you'll see a figure in that uh, fourth edition of the Crater in the Cosmos, basically showing you how those temperature measurements perfectly fit the biblically predicted curve. And so it was seeing that scientific predictive power in the Bible and the fact that the Bible ne never made a provable scientific error that persuaded me this book must come uh, from the being that created the universe. Well, what are a couple, just uh, one or two examples of that from the Bible that predicted what well, you're the saying? ones I talked about, the expanding universe, nobody had a clue about that scientifically until the 20th century. Uh, but I was particularly impressed with the first page of the Bible. I mean, that's the Genesis 1 creation account. And it describes 10 events of creation. And I recognize at age 17, each one is scientifically accurately stated. And they're all in the correct chronological order. And I actually even calculated the probability that someone without divine inspiration writing 3,400 years ago could come up with that by chance. And uh, at age 17, I calculated that probability was more remote than one chance in uh, 10 to the 80th power. And uh, so that impressed me and motivated me to continue reading through the Bible. And as I continue to read through the Bible, I found over 100 places where it had accurately predicted future scientific discoveries. And I spent 18 months looking for a scientific error. I couldn't find a single scientific error in the Bible. Now, to be honest, I did find passages in the Bible I didn't understand, but I couldn't uncover a single provable scientific error. Whereas when I went through, say, the Hindu Vedas, I was able to find dozens of them in a matter of just a day or two. And likewise with all the other world's holy books. So the Bible to me stood alone it also stood alone, and it described God in ways that can't be visualized by human beings. Whereas in all these other holy books, uh, God was described in a way that can be viewed by people that are constrained to the dimensions of length, width, height, and time. So I took that as evidence. These other books, 
they're inventions of human beings. But the message I saw in the Bible said it must come from someone who can experience more than just our four space time dimensions. Wow, I love that. And so back to Einstein. So before Einstein did, uh, was the kind of the consensus of the scientific community, was it that the universe was eternal? Yes, that was a consensus for about the 300 years previous to Albert Einstein, uh, that the universe was eternal. And uh, when Einstein solved his equations, he said, we got to fix this. And uh, that's when he came up with a cosmological constant, but he assigned a very different value to it than astronomers do today. And his goal was to adjust his equations so that there would be no beginning. Uh, but it was just a matter of a couple of decades before astronomers came up with measurements that say, hey, this is not the way the universe looks. It really does have a beginning. And Einstein admitted later in his life uh, that his alteration of his equations of general relativity was the biggest scientific blunder in his career. And so, and what was his, what was Einstein's reasoning at the end of his life for not coming to faith? Because well, I think he talks about that. He does. And he says that uh, he came to a point where he believed in the God of Spinoza, uh, but not a personal God. So he was okay with a God that creates the universe. He was okay with the universe having a beginning just a few billion years ago. Uh, but apparently he was not okay with God as a personal being that would be evaluating and judging his life. And at the end of his life, he said, what bothers me about Judaism and Christianity is that there doesn't seem to be a resolution between God predetermining everything and human free will. Uh, but again, Einstein was trying to fix that problem in the context of the dimensions we can visualize, length, width, height, and time. And you picked up that book earlier, Beyond the Cosmos, where I said long after Einstein passed away, theoretical physicists determined that there's actually 10 dimensions that make up the universe, not just four. There's six tiny space dimensions that accompany the three big ones. And the space-time theorems prove that there must be a causal agent beyond time that can create time, which implies there must be at least the equivalent of a second dimension of time. And in the context of that extra dimensionality or trans-dimensionality, you can resolve human free will and divine predetermination. But that was the big stumbling block uh, for Einstein. And he admitted that in his own words. Wow, that's interesting. And so, and let's get into the Big Bang Theory. Who, who coined that term? Because I think it was a, almost a, um, it was almost a, an attack on the idea of the Big Bang. It was. But so yeah, who it was came intended up with, to be pejorative. <laughs> well, yeah, it was, it was a, it's a pejorative term. But who, who first came up with the idea of the Big Bang? Uh, well, Fred Hoyle was the one that coined the term Big Bang. Right. Uh, but he coined it as a means of derision because uh, he was very opposed to Big Bang cosmology. Uh, he was one of the three that was proposing the steady state theory. And later he came And what's on the steady with, state theory? Can you explain that? Well, the steady state theory says the universe is expanding. But as it expands, new matter appears. Basically, Fred Hoyle uh, was hypothesizing there was a fifth force of physics, which he called a creation force. So as the universe expands, more and more matter is created. So that the universe basically looks the same at all times. And therefore, the universe would not have a beginning. It would be infinitely old. Uh, but it was, again, it was only a matter of decades before astronomers said, we look far away and the universe doesn't look the same. It's different. The universe really does look like the photo album of your grandfather, where you see him as a newborn baby, and then as an infant, and a toddler, and then as a teenager, and then you see him getting gray hair. He says, that's what the, the universe looks like. We can look far away, and hence farther back in time, and we see that the universe looks very youthful if we look far away. 
And so it's not steady state. So was part of the the um, kind of crushing that argument was part of it Hubble was, was it Hubble who discovered the redshift? Yes. And so t- well, talk Hubble about the redshift. Discovered the redshift. Talk about the redshift because I mean that's kind of like the the illustration is like there's dots on a balloon, and as the balloon expands, you see the dots kind of grow farther, farther and farther apart, and that's what's happening to the galaxies in the universe, right? That's that's what redshift is. Right. Well, that that's was the work of Edwin Hubble. He said, you know, let's measure the distances to these galaxies. Let's measure their velocities relative to us and see if it fits or contradicts and expand the universe. And in 1929, he published a paper where he says it fits and expand the universe with a beginning that's a few billion years ago. And, uh, you know, his uh, student, uh, Alan Sandage, uh, took over his project after Edwin had a sudden death. And uh, he was basically said, no, it's more than a few billion years. It's more like uh, 15 billion years. And today we got measurements that are sufficiently precise that we know it's 13.79 billion uh, plus or minus 0.04. And what did Hubble ever, was he a Christian or no? Well, uh, he was a theist. Uh, exactly. Uh, he, he, he was a private individual. And so it's really hard to tell where he was at the end of his life. Uh, but he certainly accepted that the universe had a beginning and that it implied a beginner, uh, but not a whole lot more. Uh, I mean, really, we don't know uh, exactly what he believed about that beginner, at least yeah. nothing, nothing substantial in print. Now, and you mentioned in uh, The Creator and the Cosmos that when, when the idea of the Big Bang theory, it's that the term Big Bang is misleading to the layperson. Why, why is that? Well, Fred Hoyle came up with the term, uh, you know, the Big Bang, and how lay people look at it is, it's just a chaotic explosion of all the stars and galaxies and matter and energy in the universe. And that's not what the Big Bang creation model tells us. Rather, it's a highly fine-tuned expansion of the universe. And so unlike a grenade exploding, all the matter and energy of the universe is constrained to the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional expanding universe. And the surface is highly fine-tuned. All the matter and energy on the surface is expanding at the same rate uh, to within a precision of 56 places of the decimal. So it's the most highly fine-tuned expansion phenomena we can observe in all of physical reality. So nothing chaotic about it at all. Yeah, yeah, because it does, the Big Bang sounds like chaos. So, and you you talk about the, there's three fun, fundamentals of the Big Bang that are taught in the Bible. Can you expound on that? Yeah, well, one is that the universe has a beginning a beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. Uh, and that comes out of the fact that we know that general relativity uh, governs the dynamics of the universe. And it was in the 1970s that astronomers and physicists came up with the first of the space-time theorems, which tells us it's not just a beginning of matter and energy, it's a beginning of space and time itself. So that's one uh, biblical statement. A second biblical statement is that the universe expands from that cosmic beginning. And there's 11 places in the Bible where six different Bible authors speak about this cosmic expansion. Is Not there, every, can you give an example of like, what's a, what's a verse that kind of points to that? Well, uh, there are seven verses in the book of Isaiah, uh, but they're not well translated into English. They're typically translated uh, that God was stretching out the universe, stretching it out like one unfurls a tent to live in it. Uh, so you see passages like that. But the verb that's translated stretching out is the Hebrew verb nata, which means the expansion of what's being described. Mm-hmm. And I wrote an article on that. There's a whole chapter on this uh, in the Crater in the Cosmos fourth edition, where I make the point that that Hebrew verb nata shows up in all three Hebrew verb forms when you go through those 11 biblical texts, which means this is not figurative language. The Bible literally is speaking 
talking about a cosmic expansion. And I've been accused of reading that into the text from my perspective of a 21st century astronomer. Uh, but Maimonides, uh, 850 years ago, a Jewish theologian came to the exact same conclusion based on those biblical texts. So long before astronomers discovered the expanding universe, we got the Bible stating that. The third point would be the laws of physics that govern the universe do not change. Jeremiah 33, the laws that govern the heavens and the earth are fixed. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that whole chapter, God says to the Jews, you change your mind all the time, but I'm an immutable God. I'm a God that does not change. As proof, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And then the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Romans speaks about how God has subjected the entire universe to a pervasive law of decay. And, and that's four entropy. chapters. That would be yeah. entropy, right? Yeah. That's entropy. And the message of Ecclesiastes is everything in the universe is decaying. No matter where you go, no matter what time or place, everything is decaying. And when I get pushback on that from audiences, I just tell the audience, look on one another. We're all evidence of ongoing decay. So uh, it's everywhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> However, if that's really true about the universe, uh, physicists will tell you any system that's expanding under constant laws of physics, where one of those laws is a law of entropy, aka the second law of thermodynamics, that's a system that gets cooler and cooler in a highly predictable rate. It's the principle of your automobile engine. As the piston chamber expands, it cools down and the gasoline stops burning. When you compress the chamber, if you've got a diesel engine, you don't need a spark plug because the piston chamber compresses to such a degree that that compression by itself ignites the gasoline. And so that's happening to the universe. And today we have the telescopes to look far away, hence far back in time and measure the radiation from the cosmic creation event. And uh, based on the measured age of the universe, uh, that uh, cooling curve that we measure perfectly fits what the Bible predicted thousands of years ago. Yeah, and the the Big Bang also supports the Kalam argument. Uh, can you just tell us what the Kalam argument is? Well, that's um, and do you support? I mean, are you are you a proponent of the Kalam argument or not? Yeah, I'm definitely a proponent of the Kalam argument that the universe has a beginning, uh, uh, then that implies there must be a cosmic beginner. Um, the column argument has come under attack because people say, well, okay, um, you know, uh, the universe has a cause, there must be a causer, but what about what's happening before that? And what I point out is that today, the column cosmological argument is strongly sustained by the space-time theorems because the space-time theorems tell us there is not an infinite regress in time. Mm -hmm. Time itself was created. Time was created and the universe was created. So that implies uh, that there indeed must be a causal agent outside of space and time that creates everything. So thanks to about 30 space-time theorems that have been published in the past 50 years, uh, there's no escape from the column argument. In fact, uh, the most powerful of those space-time theorems uh, the bordet guth Vilenkin theorem. Uh, Alexander Vilenkin, one of the three mm -hmm. authors of that theorem, wrote a book a year afterwards and basically said, for cosmologists, there is no escape. They have to face the fact that the universe has a cosmic beginning and everything that it implies. And what he meant by that is there has to be some cause beyond space, time, matter, and energy that brought the universe into existence. Today, there is no escape. Yeah, and you you mentioned the is it the infinite regress of uh, of time or the, what did you say the infinite regress? Well, some philosophers have tried to refute the con the column cosmological argument goes back to the ninth century A.D. and uh, some modern day philosophers have said, well, who's to say uh, that there can't be an infinite regress, an infinite number of beginnings? 
Uh, but then that would have to pa- that would have to cross infinity, which is impo- which is right. impossible, right? Well, <laughs> it's kind of it's nonsensical. Yeah, it is, and physicists have referred to it as turtles all the way down. You know that there's a universe on top of a gigantic turtle. Once underneath that turtle, another turtle. Once underneath that turtle, another turtle. It's turtles all the way down. Well, the space time theorems tell us uh, there are no turtles. You got the universe. And you got a causal agent beyond space-time matter and energy. Yeah. And so what happened in 1992 that reinforced the Big Bang Theory? It was the, with the Kobe satellite. What, what was that all about? Well, uh, there were people like Fred Hoyle and others pushing back saying, okay, if it's Big Bang, uh, then how do you explain the galaxies and galaxy clusters? Because our measurements of the radiation from the cosmic creation event we're basically saying uh, the universe has the same temperature everywhere. If the universe has the same temperature everywhere, then that means you're not going to get structures like galaxies and galaxy clusters. And Big Bang proponents uh, you know, pushed back and said, uh, all we need are very tiny temperature fluctuations in the cosmic background radiation, the radiation left over from the cosmic creation event. And they actually calculated that the the temperature variations they would need would be about one part in 100,000. Well, back in the 1980s, we didn't have instruments that sensitive. The COBE satellite was the first time we had instruments sensitive enough to see those tiny temperature differences. And uh, yeah, it came back uh, with what the Big Bang model had predicted. And uh, this was referred to uh, in newspapers around the world as a powerful proof that uh, indeed we live in a Big Bang universe with a Big Bang creation event. Since that time, much better instruments have been put into space, the latest being the Planck satellite, and uh, they've been able to make these temperature measurements to better than one part and uh, a tenth of a million. And so now we have a very detailed picture about what that uh, cosmic background radiation looks like, and the, when you look at the hot spots, the hot spots become future galaxies and galaxy clusters. And now we've got very detailed maps of galaxies and galaxy clusters, thanks to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And it perfectly fits what we see in the radiation maps of the radiation left over from the cosmic creation event. So it's basically demonstrating every year that goes by, uh, the case for Big Bang cosmology uh, gets exponentially stronger. Well, that raises the question, then why do scientists still debate the Big Bang theory? Well, it's still being put to the test. <clears throat> and uh, this is what physicists do. I mean, we're still testing general relativity. Uh, even though it's been verified to 18 places of the decimal, there are physicists out there saying, well, this is remarkable. Well, let's see if we can push it to the 20th place of the decimal. And let's see if we can see some special wrinkle in general relativity uh, that might have some significance for cosmology or particle physics. And they point out, for example, that's really what general relativity was. Uh, You go back 150 years ago, astronomers were able to explain all the observed features of the universe with Newtonian mechanics. Uh, But at the end of the 19th century, they said, we can't explain the advance in the precession of Mercury's orbit. Uh, there's a few seconds discrepancy uh, in the orbit of uh, Mercury. And, uh, and they also saw a tiny one for Venus. And so they said, there must be some tiny adjustment we need to make to Newtonian mechanics. And general relativity said, we can explain that adjustment. Now, uh, today, uh, general relativity has been exhaustively tested, as has the Big Bang creation model, and uh, we've yet to find any wrinkles, even at 18 places of the decimal. That doesn't mean we might not find them at 40 places of the decimal, but it basically tells us general relativity and Big Bang cosmology explains everything in extraordinary detail, and it looks like there isn't any hidden physics that we've overlooked. And that's why, I mean, I think that's why uh, 
some scientists or physicists go to the multiverse argument. And can you tell us what that the multiverse argument is and why it's a weak argument? Well, it was basically designed to uh, discount the personality of God. I mean, the Big Bang creation model basically tells us you have to accept deism. If I engage physicists and astronomers that call themselves atheists, uh, when I have them define their terms, they're basically deists. They do believe there's a causal agent beyond space and time that created everything, but they're emphatic that that causal agent has no personality. We're not talking of being. It's just mm -hmm. some kind of Star Wars type force out there uh, that brings a universe into existence and certainly isn't paying any attention to how I live my life. Uh, but the fine tuning of the universe basically establishes this causal agent must be a personal being. It's called the anthropic principle that when we measure the laws of physics, when we measure the features of the universe, we see a degree of fine tuned design that far transcends the best that we human beings are able to pull off by factors of 10 to the 96 times. I know, I think which, the fine tuning argument is probably the strongest argument for a creator. And so what, give us, give us some examples of fine tuning. Well, the one uh, that astronomers refer to as the greatest evidence for fine tuning that we can measure is dark energy. Uh, dark energy makes up 70% of the universe. Uh, but if you were to make the dark energy uh, somewhat stronger, it would cause the universe to expand so rapidly uh, that gravity would never be able to attract enough uh, gas to make galaxies, stars, and planets. And uh, therefore, life would be impossible. Uh, but if you make the dark energy very slightly weaker, uh, then the universe expands so slowly uh, that uh, gravity collects all the gas of the universe and compresses it in a short period of time into nothing but black holes and neutron stars. There again, you got a universe where life is impossible. And for life to be possible, you have to fine tune that dark energy to one part in 10 to the 122nd power. Uh, and if you contrast that with the best example of human fine tuning design, uh, dark energy beats out the best example of human engineering inventiveness and achievement uh, by a factor of 10 to the 96 times, uh, which means that the one that designed dark energy to make our existence possible in the universe at a minimum is a trillion, 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 trillion times <laughs> smarter than we are, more powerful than we are, uh, more intelligent and knowledgeable and caring than we are. And these are characteristics only a personal being uh, can manifest. Uh, but you're right. I mean, I was predicting back in the 1980s uh, that, hey, every year that goes by, the fine-tuning evidence gets exponentially stronger. In fact, you'll see stuff at our reasons.org website uh, basically demonstrating it gets about a thousand times stronger with every passing month. And so that really pushed the non-theists back into a corner. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do uh, with this un undeniably very compelling evidence? And they said, well, maybe we can explain away all the fine tuning. If there's an infinite number of universes where every universe is different from every other universe, and then all this fine tuning appears simply by pure chance. We happen to be living in the one lucky universe. And I predicted uh, back in the 1980s that atheists would eventually have nowhere else to go but to appeal to an infinite number of universes with an infinite variety of characteristics. Which is impossible. Come, it's impossible to verify that, you know, so it's, it's kind of, again, it's nonsensical. Well, I like, you'll see this in the Crater in the Cosmos fourth edition. I cite the atheist astrophysicist Leonard Susskind, who basically said, we atheists have got to stop using the multiverse argument to discount this God because it explains everything. And a model that explains everything explains nothing. And he kind of stopped there, but you'll see an analogy in the book where I say, well, 
if you really have an infinite number of universes uh, where every universe is different from every other, you're in that infinite number of universes, you'll have an infinite number of planets just like Earth. And on those infinite number of planets like Earth, you're going to have an infinite variety of birch tree species. And birch trees peel white pieces of bark. And if you've got an infinite variety of birch tree species, all species will peel thin white pieces of bark that are perfectly rectangular that measure eight and a half by 11 inches. And those pieces of bark will randomly fall on soils with random chemicals in them that are gonna imprint markings randomly in all those pieces of birch bark. And all those random imprintings will duplicate all the letters, equations, figures, and diagrams in every scientific research paper ever published uh, by human beings, which means all those scientific research papers, they did not come from the minds of research scientists. The multiverse did it. So basically what right. Leonard Susskind says, if you're going to appeal to the multiverse to get rid of God, you get rid of all intelligent design, including all human intelligent design. Therefore, uh, the appeal to a multiverse is worthless. It is of no benefit. We atheists have got to stop using it. It's a bad argument. But what I point out in the crater in the cosmos is that uh, atheists today have nowhere else to go. Uh, if they're not going to use the multiverse, then they really do have to accept there's a personal being that brought the universe into existence, a personal being with far more knowledge and intelligence and creativity and power and care than we human beings. Yeah. And I liked your illustration. I think it was in your, uh, there was a chapter called A Just Right Universe about fine tuning. And you, I think it's in that chapter, you give this red dime analogy or illustration. Can you tell us about that? Because I thought that was really powerful. Well, and this would apply to many of the features of the universe that we can measure. In many cases, the fine tuning is so exceptional. It's far greater than if you were to cover the entire North American continent with dimes, uh, where the dimes extend all the way up to the moon. And you would have to do that on 10 billion North American continents. And those 10 billion North American continents covered with dimes from here to the moon as densely packed together as possible you insert randomly one red colored dime in that huge pile of dimes. And uh, the fine tuning we see in many features of the universe actually exceeds that example of fine tuning that someone blindfolded could rummage through those 10 billion North American continents covered with dimes from here to the moon and be able to pick one and it would be the red one. Yeah. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing fine tuning. And you, in, uh, in the creator in the cosmos, you talk about, um, this, is, this was interesting to me. You say that Hinduism, for example, has been ruled out as a viable religion scientifically. So it, explain how Hinduism is, doesn't comport with science. Well, after I gave up on Immanuel Kant, uh, the first religious holy book I looked at were the Hindu Vedas. And uh, they speak about a reincarnating universe. Most people are aware that reincarnation is a fundamental doctrine of Hinduism. And it's based on the idea that the entire universe reincarnates. And so everything is reincarnating, including the universe as a whole. But in the Hindu Vedas, it says that the universe goes through these repeated beginnings. Uh, but the cycle time is 4.32 billion years. Well, as a 17-year-old, I knew from the measurements, it's more than 4.32 billion. It got the number wrong. Uh, but I also realized that the problem with Hinduism, they need a mechanism uh, to uh, get the universe to re repeat, uh, you know, where it has uh, an ending and then a restart. And they don't have a good explanation for the restart mechanism. And I recognize that the entropy that we observe in the universe is a hundred million times too high to make possible any mechanical restart or rebounce mechanism. And so on that basis, I said, it can't be Hinduism. This is something that's clearly contradicted by the observations of the universe. 
I next looked at Buddhism, uh, but what you see in Buddhism, it's basically the same cosmology as Hinduism. Mm -hmm. So I put that aside too. I looked at Islam and I saw that the creation texts in the Quran uh, contradict one another. And one of them actually makes the point uh, that the stars are closer to us than the planets. And you don't need telescopes to realize that's not true. Even with the naked eye, you can discern uh, that the planets are much closer to us than the stars. Yeah. And so let's let's turn to Stephen Hawking. Uh, of course, I read A Brief History of Time when it came out in the 90s. What What is... Uh, what does he what does Stephen Hawking get wrong in that book? Because it was a popular it was a very popular book and it was written in, in a popular level. But what does he get wrong about time and what does he get wrong in that book? Well, he gets a lot of things right. Uh, he basically makes the point that, hey, he was one of the authors of the first of the space time theorems, along with Roger Penrose. And he doesn't say this uh, in A Brief History of Time. But when he was interviewed for Reader's Digest, he said, we proved that the universe was created. We proved that time was created. And so he was making statements based on his own research that comports beautifully with what the Bible states. Uh, but what he does say in a brief history of time is we can escape these implications of a beginning uh, to time and a causal agent beyond time by hypothesizing that the universe as imaginary time to complement real time. And, uh, you know, a lot of us have taken courses in what's called complex variables. It's a field of mathematics where we have imaginary numbers. And uh, basically what Hawking was implying, if we can have two dimensions of time rather than a single dimension of time, then we're not stuck with a cosmic beginning. But if you read a brief history of time, he says quickly thereafter, of course, we realize the entire universe is constrained by a single dimension of time. Uh, so it was a just so story. And a lot of people don't recognize Hawking's honesty. He basically stated that it's a just so story. He says, hey, if we can hypothesize imaginary time, there's a way out. But of course, the real universe doesn't have features. Um, yeah. And he basically uh, was promoting a deistic interpretation uh, in that book. Now, later when he came out with the, uh, um, he wrote a book with Mladenow, the Caltech atheist physicist, The Grand Design. And in that book, it's clearly atheism that's being promoted, but I'm not sure uh, that it correctly describes Hawking's philosophical views. It does describe Mladenow's philosophy. No doubt Mladenow is an atheist. Uh, but the, since they were co-authors, a lot of people have presumed Hawking must be an atheist. And it's possible he became one late in his life. But when he wrote A Brief History of Time, he was basically promoting deism. And to affirm that, uh, I have a book on my bookshelf. And it's basically a book that came from a semester-long course that Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose mm -hmm. taught at Cambridge University. And uh, what was fun about the course, it was a debate course. And so Hawking and Penrose would alternate lectures. And, uh, you know, Hawking was basically defending deism and Penrose was defending theism. Neither one of them defended Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, Penrose has been on record there's purpose behind the universe. There's some kind of person behind the universe. That's as far as he takes it. Uh, but the book is quite entertaining to read, highly technical. Uh, but there's this back and forth uh, between Penrose and Hawking, a very friendly debate. But it's a, it offers really good insights from a theoretical physics perspective on looking at the universe from a deistic perspective contrasted with a theistic perspective. And I can't remember if did Hawking give a reason at the end of his life why he didn't come to faith? Was there what was what was his stumbling block? Well, you'll see it in a brief history of time. It's it's towards the end of the book where he basically says, my goal in life is to gain the mind of God, 
to know everything that God knows. And he says, I don't mean just know everything about the universe. I want to know about human free will. I want to know about God's predetermination. I literally want 100% of the mind of God. And he also wanted to be autonomous. His reaction to the Christian God is that this is a God uh, that would be in judgment over him. And he says, in fact, a friend of mine, uh, Don Page, uh, he's a theoretical astrophysicist. Uh, I knew him when I was at Caltech. And he went on to become a postdoctoral research fellow uh, with Stephen Hawking at, at uh, Cambridge. And he actually lived uh, in the home of uh, Steve and uh, Stephen and Jane uh, Hawking. But he told them as uh, he lived in, a, in his home, he says, look, I'm a Christian. Are you okay with me beginning my day uh, with a prayer and Bible study? And uh, Jane and Stephen said, yeah, we're okay with that on one condition. And, uh, you know, Don said, well, what's the condition? He says, we want to join you. <laughs> so literally for a four-year period, wow. uh, Stephen Hawking had a daily prayer and Bible study uh, with Don Page. Amazing. But what Don tells me, and, you know, his wife, Jane, was an evangelical uh, uh, Anglican. They divorced, both, though, right? They divorced. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, Hawking divorced her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what she wrote and what Don has written is, with Stephen Hawking, he's fine about God. But as soon as you cross that line to a personal God, you get the famous Stephen Hawking smirk, <laughs> which means I'm not paying attention anymore. Right. I've checked out. Right. And you, you talk about in the, in the book, you talk about um, at practical versus absolute proof. And J.P. Moreland I, I took apologetics from J.P. Moreland at uh, Talbot at Biola, but uh, and he calls he calls the practical. He uses the term I think he uses psychological certainty, but you use practical proof. And so, talk about practical proof versus absolute proof. Now, what they mean by absolute proof, where there's zero possibility for any alternate explanation. And my response to that is that's only possible if we know absolutely everything about the universe, but that'll never happen. Uh, you know, we're constrained by the space-time dimensions of the universe, which means we can learn a lot, but we're not going to learn everything. But we can learn enough where the proof becomes practical. And an analogy I've used is, you know, I've been married for 44 years, and I married my wife without absolute proof that she existed. I mean, it was a possibility. I've been fooled by a very sophisticated three-dimensional hologram. Uh, but I did enough experiments and observations to realize there's an extremely high probability that she really does exist and really is a human being. And I had enough evidence that I was prepared uh, to marry her. And I can tell you this, every year of marriage, that evidence gets stronger. But even today, after 44 years of marriage, I do not have absolute proof that my wife exists. Uh, but I got very strong practical proof that she does exist. And basically, I challenged my atheist peers saying, you make decisions every day, very confident decisions every day, without absolute proof. In fact, we don't have absolute proof of anything. Not even two plus two equals four really falls in the category of absolute proof. We have a very high probability that two plus two equals four, but it's not absolute proof. And therefore you're being philosophically inconsistent to demand this level of absolute proof for God, but you're okay with having less than absolute proof to marry the woman you're married to, uh, or to conclude as a mathematician that two plus two equals four. And so I just challenge him, you need to be consistent. How much practical evidence do you need to be persuaded that the God of the Bible exists? I asked, I challenged them to come up with a number because I know whatever number they come up with, I can deliver. <laughs> I can come up with the evidence that they're asking for that this God really does exist. And often that gives me an opportunity to say, I think there's another reason why you're resisting uh, giving your life to Jesus Christ as creator, Lord and savior. Can we talk about those reasons? But I want to put a caveat on that. I found that you cannot 
go down that path until you first build a level of trust and establish credibility and integrity on the scientific issues. If you can do that, uh, then you will reach a point where people are willing to trust you with their deep personal reasons. And typically, it's someone that wounded them. I mean, yeah. Uh, an example that I think you'll see in the book is that uh, I participated in a debate at Caltech in front of the International Skeptic Society. So I debated the particle physicist Victor Stenger in front of 750 atheists from all over the world. And after the debate was over, uh, I engaged uh, the atheists in the audience. And I said, I've seen a new piece of evidence for my Christian faith this weekend, right here at your conference. And of course, that got their attention. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, what do you mean? And I said, well, I was last on your program. And but I attended all the lectures from these world leading atheist scientists. And what I observed from each one of them and from all of you in the audience is how extremely passionate you are that the God of the Bible does not exist and how your whole focus is on the God of the Bible. As says all the other gods of the religions of the world you ignored. The whole focus was the God of the Bible. And it says, if you really were persuaded that the God of the Bible doesn't exist, you'd all be treating him like the Easter bunny. But the fact that you're so passionate about his non-existence tells me you really do believe he exists, but you don't like him. And that's the response a, I yeah. got, the that's response really I got from people in the audience was, it's not that we hate the God of the Bible, it's that we despise his followers. And one after another, I got stories mm. of how they've been wounded by people that claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Wow. And there was a passage in the book of Matthew that says, if you will not forgive others, the God that you offended will not forgive you. Because what you're doing as a human being saying, this human wounded me more than we all have wounded Christ on the cross. We're basically saying the offense I experience is bigger than the offense God experienced. And the reason uh, Matthew says that's a problem, you're basically putting yourself above God. And yeah. so, however, I tell people, look, I can understand that you're struggling trying to forgive this person that offended you. And you often always it's in their youth. But I said, would you be willing to allow the God that you offended to a far greater degree to step by step give you the power to forgive this person. If they say yes to that, I got hope for them. But if they say I'll never forgive that person till the day I die, then I said, well, I'm not sure uh, that you'll ever be able to receive the offer of forgiveness and redemption from the one that created the universe. Wow, I love that. That's amazing. And do you agree with this assertion? Because this is uh, JP Moreland talked about this that there is empirical evidence of the existence of God in terms of, and he, he illustrated it this way. If you line up, let's say a hundred born again, Christians, like genuine Christians, if you line them up and ask them what happened to you, that uh, uh, each story will basically be the same. I was lost. I, now I'm found my life was a, a wreck and now it, I'm, you know, it's totally transformed. So what do you think about that argument the, the, as an empirical argument for the existence of God? Well, it's one empirical argument. I would add, though, you need to combine that with what I would say more concrete and persuasive arguments, uh, because I see the same thing in uh, uh, Islam mm -hmm. and Hinduism. They'll line up a bunch of people. But I think what's interesting about uh, J.P. Moreland's uh, uh, analogy there is you line up a hundred Christians, you're going to get a hundred different stories, but every one of those Christians has been transformed. You're going to get the down and outers. You're also going to get the up and outers mm -hmm. people whose lives were fantastic. Everything was going their way. And they too had a transformation where they realized, you know what, even though my life is so successful, uh, there's something missing. And, uh, 
And I run into those kinds of people more often than I do the down and outers. It's the up and outers. Yeah. And uh, I was so, an up and outer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I was an up and outer. And so how does, this is the, the basically the last question. And then I'll just ask one more thing, but how does science, how does all of this get us from a transcendent creator to the God of the Bible? Very good question. I mean, one of my more popular talks I give when I'm speaking on university campuses or business firms, cosmic reasons to believe in Christ. And kind of where we began this interview, okay, how do we establish deism? There must be a causal agent beyond space and time. And how can we appeal to science to go from deism to theism, where there must be a personal God? And then how can we use science to show that this personal God must be a redeeming God? Because that's the distinction of the God of the Bible. It's not just a God that creates and creates us. It's a God that redeems us uh, from the grip of sin and evil over our lives. And so what we've been doing at Reasons to Believe, and you'll see this in my latest books, and I got a book coming out in a few months uh, called Design to the Core. And uh, what I'm doing in Improbable Planet and Design to the Core, why the universe is the way it is, is say the strongest fine-tuning argument you get is when you put the design of the universe uh, the earth and earth's life in the context of what needs to happen in order for billions of humans or the equivalent of humans to be redeemed from sin and evil uh, permanently while they retain their free will. And what I've been discovering is literally every component of the universe, earth and earth's life, and every event in the universe, earth and earth's life plays some role in making possible the redemption of billions of human beings in a relatively short period of time. I mean, you get this much fine tuning evidence of what you need to do to get bacteria. You get way more uh, fine tuning evidence if you want bacteria that stick around for 3 billion years. And you need that to chemically transform a planet so plants and animals become possible. But the level of fine tuning uh, for plants and animals is exponentially greater than what you need to get bacteria uh, for 3 billion years. And then to get humans uh, living, not just plants and animals, but humans, the exponential evidence goes up far greater than it does for plants and animals. But the greatest increase in fine tuning evidence is not just for human beings, but for billions of humans to be redeemed from their sin and evil. And yeah, literally every event, every component, plays a role, the entire universe and all of its features have been designed to make our redemption possible. And lately what I've been doing with my secular peers is saying, look, I know you're not a Christian. I know you don't believe in God, but I'll give you a tip on how you can become a more successful scientist. Do your scientific research from a biblical redemptive perspective. And, and why don't you see if that makes you more successful and coming up with amazing scientific discoveries. Put it to the test. But of course, my goal is, as they become a more successful scientist, they'll realize maybe there's something to this Christian faith I need to check out. Yeah, and that's that's what happened to me. I mean, I was so kind of frustrated my whole kind of adult life and nothing really, there was no sort of uh, paradigm or um, theory of the universe or theory of, of life that really made sense. And then once I was transformed by the gospel and I read the Bible, it, it's like every single word, it just all made sense. It just made sense. Everything was like, Oh, I, I finally could relax. <laughs> I finally could breathe. Cause I was like, this is perfectly like, it's just, it just makes perfect sense. Every single thing in this, in this book. Is, is, is amazing. So well, I had the same experience. It wasn't just all this scientific accuracy and predictive power I saw in the Bible. Uh, the moral message of the Bible had an amazing elegance and beauty to it. It was so elegant and beautiful. Yes. I said, I want to do everything I can to live up to this moral standard. And for a year and a half, I tried to do that and realize I don't have the resources to pull that off. But as I read the Bible, God said, look, 
uh, I, this book was written basically to make that point. No one can live up to the standard that I demand, but I'm here to give you what you can't do for yourself. And so that's just too good of an offer to turn down. Well, I love that. We'll leave it at that. And I hope, um, Chase, if you're watching, I hope this, this helps you. And Dr. Hugh Ross, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. And people can get free chapters of my books, reasons.org slash Ross.